good morning uh, good afternoon or good evening i think we will be having a participant joining us from all over the world and we have our, our panelists also in in different time zones so uh, i like to welcome you all uh, in our today's session uh, and our topic for today's session is uh, uh, global goals uh, how may we meet our high aspiration uh, in our session uh, uh, we will discuss as the most uh, nation did not meet their 2020 in income social development goal SDGs and their climate change uh, targets and thus might miss their 2030 goals uh, and also how to promote uh, achievable mini goals in the world of uh, and and disbeliefs and fake news uh, and and how to change attitude into uh, and can do more to overcome resistance to the change uh, can we really foster the shane, shared uh, humanity uh, so uh, and what more can we can we do to support uh, uh, and i think uh, in the current uh, environment uh, uh, definitely all the governments and and, and doing their best uh, uh, we have uh, great uh, experts and panelists uh, and i like to uh, introduce them uh, uh, first uh, uh, first we have uh, uh, ms jenny uh, uh, go who's the co-founder of uh, Magnetic Project of Canada. Uh, Jenny is an uh, award-winning creative producer, uh, XR Arts collector, uh, tech entrepreneur. Uh, she has been named on Forbes 30 under 30 in 2018, uh, and also the AAC YF 30 under uh, in 2020 last year, uh, backed by HTC uh, VVX and TechStars, uh, her company. Uh, uh, Lomer VR is using computer vision and mixed reality in and the retail industry. The VR project she had worked on uh, have also won uh, multiple awards in both Asia and in the United States of America. She has produced uh, and distributed multiple VR installations, uh, including Renate artist uh, Rachel McLean. And I am uh, terribly sorry with the KWM Art Center. Uh, uh, Wang Sen, maybe it's the time to refresh the art world at the little bit uh, at K11 Art Mall in Hong Kong and uh, and also her producing work living distance uh, with artist uh, uh, Shin Liu has been selected into multiple Renard film festivals so including Sudanus and I, I can go on Beijing Film Festival and and a lot of Chinese projects and 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 different ways. So we, I Miss Gao is a passionate about uh, conservation and climate change project. Uh, she has a new VR film on glacier conservation coming uh, out this year. Uh, she is a double majored in electronic arts and political studies uh, uh, and also uh, uh, from uh, uh, studied creative producing at Columbia University. And she has extensive experience in auction houses and art. Uh, so uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you uh, into our panel today. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, Next, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Till uh, uh, Keshner, who is the co-founder and uh, managing director of Centrity uh, from Germany. He's joining us today. Uh, he, after co-founding an e-commerce startup uh, during the new economy in 2000, uh, he was responsible for building up an e-business uh, at uh, T-Mobile and uh, job board uh, Monster Worldwide. Uh, he then led the marketing department to a, a digital age between uh, 2012 and 15. Uh, he played a key role in development and success of Silicon Valley company LinkedIn uh, in the Dutch region as a, as a managing director. Uh, following his time as a digital and social media agency, uh, he built up the deep tech startup uh, ArtSense uh, as a co-founder uh, with Professor Daniel. Uh, from a technical university of uh, munich uh, among others uh, and uh, the vc funded company made into a global top 10 of computer vision startups in the field of self-driven vehicles uh, which was sold in a uh, publicly listed company in japan uh, last year uh, since then Atil has been building new projects as a serial entrepreneur and also uh, supports a founder and as a mentor and advisor 
In addition to entrepreneur view, we focus on the human perspective, such as the situation of the founders, uh, team building, uh, leadership, uh, corporate culture, understanding the motivational context of target groups and stakeholders. I'd like to welcome you uh, to the panel. Uh, next, uh, we I would like to uh, introduce Mr. Toby uh, Thomskin, and the founder and chief executive officer of Cefo uh, from United States of America. Uh, he's a futurist, a trusted advisor, founding CEO of, of the company, and, and a creator of beautiful uh, leadership. Uh, Toby also speaks, we blogs and writes on the future of the work, uh, leadership equity on sustainability. Uh, he's a professional and a personal leadership development app he has for executives, the entrepreneurs, students, distributed teams and individuals interested in sustainable growth and transformation. Uh, his company is also a digital platform for the beautiful le leadership and, and invite only community and leadership development uh, methodology for leaders who are committed to building sustainable and inclusive teams, uh, cultures, societies that are rooted in care and transparency. Uh, the Cepho app uh, provides our users a real and virtual lifelong learning community and network that develops them to lead of change uh, they seek in the world. Uh, before founding uh, this app, uh, Toby held a chief diversified role of uh, Baxter Healthcare uh, and Amco Oil and a senior role in international development, uh, multinational corporations and a global nonprofit organization, including USAID. Uh, craft general foods and and others so i'd like to welcome you uh, uh, in our panel uh, today uh, we were expecting two more uh, uh, panelists but unfortunately they could not join us uh, so uh, but let me introduce lastly myself uh, i'll be moderating the session today i am Tariq Ahmed Nizami, the founder and CEO of uh, CEO Club Network uh, Worldwide, which is uh, one of the largest business network organizations in the world for three decades, having presence in more than 50 countries, with CEOs and high executives members worldwide for more than 36 years, I'm heading a U.S.-based international CEO club holdings, uh, which have interest in multiple other industries in real estate, healthcare, entertainment, education, IT. And I have received uh, more than 30 international awards, including U.S. Presidential Award in 1989. And, and uh, in Dubai, which I am uh, moderating right now, the Prime Minister of, of the United Arab Emirates also presented the Dubai Quality Award to me in, in 2018. Uh, uh, last month, uh, I was appointed as the Vice Chairman for United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, Arise UAE uh, uh, representative. Also, I am the uh, executive director and shareholder for Hollywood Studios in, in USA and, and, and also an advisor to Chinese government in their uh, new man-made island coming up uh, uh, soon. So this is uh, myself. So I'd like to welcome you all and in our panel and what uh, the way I like to conduct this session that I will be asking a question with uh, each uh, uh, panelist uh, and I'd like you to briefly answer. Uh, in few minutes, and also any of the uh, panelists can make a comment after the answer if they like to. You know. So, first question. Uh, uh, but before I go question, I think I want to ask each of our panelists to share your thoughts on today's topic. So, I like to give a uh, floor to uh, Miss Jenny first uh, to for a few minutes. Uh, uh, if you like to uh, say anything to our 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 attendees today, I think um, is. Uh, can you guys hear me? Oh. I think sure, it's a yes. really, really, uh, like since last year, it's like being a really strange time. You know, it's almost like everything is, the, the whole globalization suddenly is kind of put on a pause. And we all kind of coming back to this um, root to think about what humanity really means in this really difficult time because we're so cut off from everyone else. So I've been uh, used to travel like 70 times a year. I, I bet the rest of the panels are doing that. Suddenly you're st staying home. I start to really think about even the ties between the nature and human are cut off in so many ways. Uh, so for me, because I work in the digital space and for us it's almost it, it sort of accelerate that uh, digital space so quickly in a way that uh, I feel very nervous about 
what's that going to do to humanity, even though I'm in the VR space and also uh, the blockchain space uh, in terms for how that's going to change humanity and our relationship uh, with each nation and with climate change, all that is like changing dra- dramatically. And we need to really uh, come together and t- take a moment to look at to look at the past and what's uh, in the future in front of us and how we can address these issues uh, together. So I, I find this uh, topic is really, really interesting because uh, I'm currently stuck in the States. Uh, I'm originally from China. So you kind of like my government, you know, way make it very difficult for us to come back even. And uh, I was in India like two years ago. Uh, I probably, I feel like for a very long time, I wouldn't be able to go back either. So suddenly I feel all these um, connections we had and those uh, convenience they have are suddenly put on pause. Uh, but it's a really good time to really uh, begin to do some reflection on why we're not meeting all these goals. Uh, for each nation and uh, how can, for my goal is how can potential using uh, emerging technology and also arts and culture uh, help to bridge that kind of gap. Um, yeah. All right, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Till to uh, give your opening remarks, please. Uh, yeah, um, thanks, Jenny. I, I really think uh, that is the core of what a lot of people feel um, isolation and um, let's say a lot of time in limited with limited range and travel opportunity uh, helped people to kind of um, reflect on what is meaningful to them uh, compared to uh, a lot of uh, you know things built on ability to distract you from humanity and now people are confronted with uh, the core elements of it. And I believe I want to turn the thought around. I see um, uh, the opportunity to use this type of focus people have and uh, tap into um, motivations people have rediscovered to connect, to learn, to um, do meaningful things. And I believe the basis of that is um, uh, actually really finding ways to... um, basically use motivations and make them become actions and make them become impactful actions. And uh, the idea I'm going to suggest is something that will help people or we should have the opportunity to help people um, to connect based on shared motivations and actually exchange information, knowledge, um, and uh, maybe also learnings in order how to actually do it. I think it's a great opportunity right now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Till. Now I'd like to request uh, Mr. Toby uh, to give your opening remarks, please. I think you are mute, uh, I, I think. Yeah. Is that better? <laughs> yes. Uh, you thank, better. You, thank you very much, Tan, <laughs> and, and good afternoon or morning or evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and thank you. Nice to meet you all on my panelists. Um, I, I'm excited to, to have a conversation with everyone and, and share our, our thoughts. I, you know, I, I think what, what, what both of the, my colleagues on the panel said really resonates. I mean, the fact is, is that we've not gone through one pandemic. We've actually are going through several. I mean, there's an economic pandemic and there's a health pandemic, of course. There's also a social and social justice pandemic. And I'm sure we could find one or two more in there. There's a financial pandemic. So... So when we think about uh, this piece, leaders right now are really, really, really dealing with uncharted change. Um, there, they are at the at the on the other side of the VUCA curve: volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and 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 ambiguity. And in those moments, leaders tend to revert back to old and oftentimes comfortable and bad practices. So part of what we need to do is rethink and reframe how we develop leaders today, and I would suggest for the next decade, um, because high aspirations and chaos are like oil and water. However, they show the leader who they are, and what I think we have as a wonderful opportunity is to rethink how we wrap around support to our leadership, and I don't just mean the CEO, I mean the leadership team, I mean the governing boards, Um, Our ESG statistics are already telling us 
that the greatest outcomes come through the metrics around the G part of, of ESG, of the governance part. So we need to focus our attention there. We need to be really clear and elevated about the metrics and the reward criteria. We need to share lived experiences, not just data, so that people can hear the story. So there I was, <laughs> this is what <laughs> happened. And here's how I got through it. That's what will stick, that's what will inspire people, and that's what will give us new solutions to, to challenging um, circumstances, yeah. All right, okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I see Mr. Theodore Wells, uh, the member of the board and of uh, WEDC Smart Cities from USA has just uh, joined us. Uh, I'd like to welcome you in our panel. Uh, since uh, uh, I would request you first that if you can kindly introduce uh, yourself, your profile uh, to uh, other panelists and to the attendees. Uh, and then if you can give uh, uh, opening remarks after that, I appreciate. I, I appreciate that. And I apologize for my tardiness. As, uh, as someone who has served at a CIO for a Fortune 42 company, I can say that logging on to the computer is sometimes more challenging than one might imagine. Um, by, by background, I'm a, a postgraduate fellow from Harvard Medical School in Informatics and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government in both national and international security. I've worked as a senior executive in aerospace, in healthcare, in finance. I serve as the chief development officer for a private equity fund out of Kuwait, managed by His Excellency, the vice chairman of the Supreme Council, as a vice chairman of an asset management company in Switzerland. And I am the vice president for the board of directors for the G20 Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion and the WBAF, which is the World Business Angel Fund Forum for World Smart and Digital Cities. In addition to that, I'm the CEO of a healthcare technology company um, that strives to improve health through the use of AI, IoT, and distributed ledger technologies. So um, beyond the, the credentials that I have, when I think about how we may meet our high aspirations, it, it calls to me, um, first of all, how are we defining who are the we that we're talking about and in what context? Are we talking about a global context as individuals or are we talking about the various organizations that we are an integrated part? From the World Economic Development Commission, um, we have more than 500 cities that have identified that they're engaged in smart and digital cities and more than 127 countries. So when we're talking about aspirations within that context, each of my esteemed colleagues have identified critical things, learning, culture, chaos, inspiration, motivation, and execution. And when we, we look at those things, whether you're feeling trapped in the United States, and I'm from the US and I feel trapped in the United States right now because I have not traveled out of the country in 15 months. And I can tell you that at 57 years of age, I've spent more than half of my life outside of the country. And this is the first time in 10 years that I have not been traveling uh, to either the Middle East or Asia or, or Europe or, or South America for the better part of, of my year. And I've spent a year in Florida, which has been nice, but it's a little different. So as we're looking to meet our aspirations, I would challenge our, our listeners and my colleagues to think about what are the driving forces, especially when we think about the context of polarization, which has embraced the world, not just the United States, but has embraced the world over the last decade. Um, right and left are, have gotten more and more extreme, and um, the challenge to finding common ground is challenging our ability to achieve high aspirations. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, you know, uh, very rightly said. Uh, and now what I will do in the session, I will be asking a question with each uh, uh, panelist. Uh, so mm -hmm. I would like to ask a uh, uh, first question with uh, Ms. Jenny. Uh, uh, tell us about uh, more about your projects that you are uh, involved in climate change and conservation. 
can share your your project brief with us. Oh hi. Um, so hi. actually, um, for me, I'm very passionate about using emerging technology and arts and culture to bridge that kind of gap because lots of uh, time it's about policy making. Is it? It is about what each organization is going to do. But to me, it's really about how we're able to reestablish that kind of the basic, the foundation of humanity through something we understand, which is storytelling. And uh, for, for my experience being like six years in the emerging technology in VR using um, this uh, new type of tech, even for right now, like even for blockchain, like trying to build the new type of metaverse, a new type of economy, the decentralized uh, way is more to kind of establish a new world, a new foundation, because there's no rules yet. Like for instance, for VR, when I first started in virtuality, there's no rules to tell you what to say, what not to say, how do you direct, how do you visualize things? And what's really fascinating about VR is you're really able to teleport someone into a world that person could never be in. And it's completely different because it's, multi-sens- it's multi-sensory and it is really about changing people's perspective. So I've done lots of uh, conservation projects. I did one in uh, Ethiopia way back uh, about to document all the tribes, which is already a a loss. Most people are not going to travel to Ethiopia to see those uh, tribes, and especially right now with the pandemic. But if we are able to use, let's say, new type of technology to tech, document all these stuff and bring back to the states, bring back to you know all kinds of different countries who don't have access to it, and you actually literally feel like you're there and to experience something that's completely different. And I'm also I did a piece uh, back then in uh, Costa Rica about. Um, jungle of rainforest uh, protection and uh, endangered species like spider monkeys. These type of places, to be honest, I, I, I never imagined where I'm able to travel for so long. And think about places like that. Probably people won't be able to, and you don't want people to visit at all because you want to keep the environment as well. But we are able to have a, school, a small group of people going there to document, uh, to have all these uh, digitalize all these and come back and bring all the uh, data, the footage, all everything back to show to people. And I feel like that really changed people how they see things uh, because it's not a flat screen. You literally feel like you're there. Uh, so that I found that's like completely like a new way to really connect human. And just uh, based on a lot of the data we have in terms of how people feel about environment about these content through storytelling is way easier to educate the general public compared to let's say we do something that's really about you know policy people have to implement uh, look at uh, taking shanghai for example for the recycling right it's a very failed policy to me because everyone has been forced uh, to recycle in different uh, different uh, category and completely become a habit because people don't care about it why would they recycle but think about if we're able to use technology using art to do installation in the public retail centers and people have access to it and educate at a very young age like Japan people do it themselves so for me it's really how we uh, change how we meet the high aspiration is really at the core like what human really want like use stories use real experience use something they never have access or ne- they're never aware of and bring that to them and using technology really can enhance that and that way i think in a way can do that and i'm currently working on a, a project um glacier because the climate change as well uh in terms of the whole story is about eventually only one piece of glacier is being left and being auctioned so it's all storytelling based. But in a way, after you watch the whole experience, you feel like what it was like when you are the only connection, only the contact with that single piece of glacier. People feel very different and people feel intrigued. Uh, so that's kind of like all, all my work are related to like how to we can bring that kind of connection between human and human, human culture of human and uh, global issues and human and environment. Well, thank you uh, very much. I think you've been around uh, everywhere, and I think you're doing a great work. What I what I what uh, what I hear, you know. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your thought. If any of our panelists have any comment uh, on what what Jenny just said, uh, uh, please uh, uh, go ahead. If, uh, if it, 
anybody like jump in and say anything or any comment? Okay, uh, if yeah. not, sure, if sure go ahead. Uh, Jenny, I, I'm particularly impressed with the use of VR for building connections um, ethnographically um, and from an anthropological standpoint. You're allowing people to, to be participant observers in a safe way without trampling on either the environment and without cultural appropriation, which is really important for preserving the culture and building bridges of understanding. And those bridges of understanding are what leads to the next, connect, the next level of connection, which is achieving mutual aspirations, I believe. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now I, I'd like to move to uh, Mr. Till. Uh, I will ask him that you were a managing director for Dash for LinkedIn. Uh, how can international networks support achieving uh, global goals? You know, can you share your thoughts? Sure. Thanks for the question. So I um, have experienced uh, with LinkedIn how a strong cultural uh, background of a company can um, build gui guide guidelines or guiding principles for people's actions in companies. Um, we all have learned um, how strong, uh, let's say, um, the corporate culture impacts success and um, impact of companies in general. LinkedIn is one of the greatest examples I've ever experienced personally. Um, when I joined, it was a couple of thousand people. It was a startup at heart in a way still. And uh, they were opening a new office on the globe almost every couple of weeks with young sales folks, uh, no overhead organization, people very much driven by a vision and uh, by smart recruiting managers who understood how to hire for cultural fit and less for skills and train skills later. So the um, idea that um, I have for, for this question is that I believe uh, connecting people with shared motivations is one of the strongest uh, micro activity uh, that will support um, achieving high aspirations in terms of the global goals. I, I think um, it's very much the anchor of getting companies involved. It is helpful for building uh, groups who can create impact um, by transferring know-how, by igniting people with inspiration, with ideas, with best practices and so on. So I have seen how um, business very importantly, business networks, uh, much more than social networks, business networks, people have an actual motivation to drive their, build their careers, their personal brands, and so on, have contributed to international goals being achieved. Good, good. Thank you very much. So I think LinkedIn, uh, we, everybody has to have a presence in LinkedIn now. You know, if you're not on LinkedIn, you don't you don't exist in business community. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Any comment from uh, other panelists? Okay, uh, now I like to move to Mr. Toby, uh, and I like to ask a question: that what new ways of thinking about uh, how we develop and hold a leader accountable should we be considering it uh, post the pandemic to ensure the better ESG's uh, outcomes? Uh, thank you. Um, that's a, it's, a, it's a good question and one that I, I spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, I, I think some of what we've heard already really speaks to, to this. You know, I was, as Phil was speaking, I was reminded, I was thinking that when people are starting their careers and trying to think about what's the ideal job, the job that they are going to love because people want to love their work and they want to love their boss and they want to love what their company does. And I hear that much more often at the beginning of people's careers than I do even at the middle of their careers. By the time people reach sort of full stride, it, it's not about love. It's about opportunity. It's about positioning. It's about um, the ladder, et cetera. And, and then at the end of their careers, it's about loss. <laughs> It's about what they didn't get to do. It's about the changes they didn't get to make. Um, and so I think that this moment that we're in has scrambled a lot of that up for people, for leaders who are now sitting here going, wow, I've been leading major multinational organizations and I don't know what to do next. 
um, I, I saw that, you know, I was on, was leading conversations with three and 400 employees and the CEO virtually, Jenny, <laughs> right after George Floyd. And the person of the most was the C-suite. <laughs> they were absolutely terrified about how to, ha to allow this space, how to hold the space for trauma, for psychological, and to how to create psychological safety in their organizations. And the values and the principles and all of the language and sweet talk was not sufficient. So I think that part of what we need to do now is start with leaders where they are, understand and help them identify what feels uneasy, what trauma have you endured, we, you know, and we need to develop them vertically, not horizontally. We need to really go deep with them, give them, and that's, you know, they need someone, they need a voice, they need a team that they can trust, um, someone who they don't have to lead or, you know, sort of be on for, but who can actually move them forward. And I think that that's really, really important. Um, and I think that the pandemic has given us that in a very positive way. That's the silver lining here. Yes, yeah, I think pandemic has taught us a lot, you know, in last 12 months, I think so many things have happened uh, domestically and internationally in every country. I think we all have learned and some things we had to go back to our drawing board and make changes according to to to, to accept uh, pandemic as part of uh, a disaster actually right now. Yeah, and, uh, and technology you. continues to push our buttons too. And I think that's a good thing. I mean, as we all struggle to even to get onto this conference panel, you know, it's... Yes, yeah, so well, the, there, is a, there, is a, there is a word in uh, German, um, the word for entrepreneur is Unternehmer, which is actually coming from the word to a become active. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think when the pandemic literally struck industries, you could find a very clear differentiation between managers and entrepreneurs because managers started playing the so-called SMA games. They were just looking at securing their own situations and trying to um, um, find ways to look best in their own positions. And uh, the Unternehmer, the people who do things, they started doing things. And that was such an obvious differentiation, I believe, uh, which really helped um, staff of companies who could openly see in this company, people are doing something mm -hmm. about it. In this company, my manager is basically just looking after him or herself. It, it, right. It's a really interesting point, like how you adapt to this, right? Because I, I remember last year, because I'm currently also with the uh, Hover Visualization Lab. Last year, like when the pandemic first started, Hover basic panic like lots of institution panic because they don't know how to teach students on Zoom because it's so boring. It's, it's such a, and I remember have sitting in this one of the meeting and everyone just freak out. They start to want to buy different type of startup software, see how to diversify the teaching classroom. And actually my lab, the, the director, he's like 70 year old, but he come up with this idea. He wants to build a virtual Harvard which is quite interesting. So during pandemic, because every single building was empty, we get to scan like almost 200 buildings to get all the data to uh, reconstruct that in VR, maybe later on to use it as a virtual classroom. So, so you see like different type of innovator during this uh, pandemic doing things. And, and even for restaurant business, right? If you look at it, it's something simple. Every restaurant, because my family was in, in restaurant business as well. And it was like huge, huge bad news. You, everything closed, you couldn't open anything, but there are, you know, small entrepreneurs and, you know, like mom and pop shop be able to switch to online, to switch to different, uh, using the new type of technology or platform, tons of startup coming out, right? So, so I found like, uh, this is a really interesting time to see, uh, the, see how leaders uh, react and how even leaders who share their vulnerability with their um, team to, to see what's not working, you know, to come back to really re reflect. So that's very, very interesting what you guys are sharing here. Yeah, I, I love that. I'm reminded of the organizations that have fundamentally retooled their manufacturing floors to produce hand sanitizers and masks, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we haven't really stopped to talk about what did that do for the sense of, of pride for the employees, of connectedness, of, of, of value and worth. 
um, you know, it, it at least they could say, well, whatever we're going through, this is what we stand for in the midst of this storm. So I, I, I agree. And, and, um, and that's, you know, technology's made that possible, I think, in, in, a, in a very powerful way. Yes, yeah, definitely. I think what we learned that uh, we can be in, uh, uh, have a meeting in US and next minute in Europe and next minute in Asia, you know, and we don't have to travel. So I think that's a very, uh, you know, good way of uh, doing the business. And, uh, and anyway, okay, so thank you very much. Uh, and now I'd like to ask a, a question to uh, Mr. Theodore, if, if you can, I'll just ask a general question with you, that how can global corporation can help nations to achieve the development goals in, in a climate change. You know, if you, your, your thoughts on that, please. I, I, I'm glad you asked that because I have exactly the complete answer, um, which is clearly going to allow me to make trillions and trillions of euro. And um, I'm going to share it here for free. Um, I, I, wish I, I wish I knew. Um, and I, what, I, what I will share is that um, the issue of uh, global, global climate issues mirrors the same issues that we have with multilateral markets, that there are massive holes in policy, in administration, in finance. And um, again, I, I will fall back to the polarization of um, political parties, which has isolated science into you know, this must be true, therefore this cannot be true. And, you know, when when we look at the Seychelles, for example, um, it's a little island that's not going to be here in 30 years. It's going to be underwater. There's, there's no science that changes that. Um, when, when we look at the parts of Antarctica, which are falling into the ocean and raising the, the level of seawater and the temperature, is is raising by a degree or two every every year year and a half there's no arguing with that now having said that um some of the climate change has attached itself to issues um like uh, jet travel and automobiles and um when the largest contributor to global warming is the manufacturer of concrete and the largest area that that happens in is actually uh, China. And the second largest area is India. Um, and the third largest area is not the United States, which is an interesting position because we take an awful lot of that burden on ourselves. Um, the, the creation of um, high efficiency combustion engines has nearly been crushed. And yet in Canada, there are, um, there's an amazing company called Z Engines that has a, a combustion engine which is 97% efficient with all fuel types. Now, that's a really fascinating thing because it means that um, the cost to run that engine, whether it's a high-performance engine for a big manufacturing plant or for a bus or for an automobile, is significantly less than what it would be for an electric vehicle, which the electric vehicle is fabulous. I, don't get me wrong. I, I'm really looking forward to picking up my EV Hummer in about a year and a half um, <laughs> because I like big cars and electricity. But um, when we look at that, we can see that the manufacturing of the batteries is a huge drain. Um, and there's lots of efficiencies that need to come into this so that the battery types are a higher efficiency. They have less uh, contribution to climate d climate disasters, like the the uh, man mining of lithium, for example, is a huge negative impact. Lots of cyanide and mercury poisoning, um, and so those type, sort of things. As we're looking at big corporations, I think the corporations need to uh, take a stand on where and how they're sourcing materials. And, and the truth is, it does cost more to not go to a, a third, fourth, or fifth world country where the labor practices and the, the um, climate issues are, are so horrendous that they're allowing the cost of, of, of finished materials to exit the country at the expense of uh, indigenous environments. So 
as as I'm looking at this, and I'm a fortune, I'm a former Fortune 42 um, senior executive. I need to be able to think and, and look at my constituents around the world, and say, what can we do that is um, actually open, transparent, and good for the environment, and still be profitable. And and those are the challenges that I help uh, executives face uh, through my private equity work.